Hello and welcome everyone to Hot Topics, a Duraspace members webinar series. My name is Christy Searle and I will be facilitating today's session. For your convenience, there is a Q&A feature located in your menu. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions from our audience and we'll ask you to post your questions there at that time. Today's webinar is being recorded and both the recording and slides will be made available after the presentation. We are pleased to have you with us for the third webinar in our series, Beyond North America, Widening Access and Participation. Today's webinar, Securing Community Controlled Infrastructure, Sparks Plan of Action, will be presented by Heather Joseph. Heather serves as Sparks Executive Director, leading the strategic and operational activities of the organization. She has focused Sparks efforts on supporting new models for the open sharing of digital articles, data, and educational resources. Under her stewardship, Spark has become widely recognized as the leading international force for effective open access policies and practices. Heather is an active participant on committees and projects at several U.S. federal agencies and serves on the board of directors of key nonprofit organizations that support open sharing of knowledge, including DuraSpace. Thank you for being with us today, Heather. I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Christy. It's really lovely to be here. Um, thank you uh, to David and Mike also for inviting me to be part of this great um, uh, webcast series. I'm honored that uh, you chose um, our efforts at Spark to uh, share with your group today. Um, and yeah, as Christy said, what I'm going to do is you guys are actually the very first people <laughs> to hear um, what we've been up to uh, in terms of details on our project uh, around community controlled infrastructure, um, doing a market analysis and essentially coming up with an action plan and a strategy moving forward. So what I'm going to do and try to cover today um, are, is a couple of things. First, I'm just going to spend a really brief time uh, just revisiting uh, the impetus for the project, um, uh, going over why we decided uh, to do this project in the first place, um, and remind you um, of uh, what our hypothesis was and uh, uh, why we, we felt so strongly about getting this off the ground. Um, I'll give you details about what it is we decided to do in terms of producing a market analysis, um, including a financial analysis and an analysis of strategies of some of the key commercial players in uh, starting in the infrastructure um, arena, uh, the implications of those strategies for our community, and trying to come up with a set of proposed responses uh, that the community might take. Then I'll tell you um, about what we've been finding, what we found out. Um, which has been super interesting, and I hope you will find it interesting as well. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about where we are in terms of the responses um, and what we're planning to do next and what you can expect in terms of when you get access to uh, the analysis and documents and supporting things. Um, so that's the game plan. Uh, when I've timed this out, which <laughs> I do obsessively, um, just to be sure, it's roughly 45-ish minutes, 43, 45 minutes. So I hope we will have plenty of time for questions. I will say in advance, there's a ton of detail in the analysis. I've tried to keep the slides very high level. Um, so if there are things that I say in, um, uh, you know, sort of the narrative that you don't see reflected on the slides or that you have questions about, please feel free to pop questions in at any time and I, I will, you know, make it a point to try to deal and hit them as, as deeply as we can at the very end. If I don't, um, you guys know where to find me. So please, uh, this is something that my last slide will, will say again that uh, your input in moving forward is going to be critical. So. Um, consider this an open invitation to to chat at any point about uh, about what we're going to talk about. So um, the proximate cause for doing this initiative, um, uh, I think we all remember very well, was uh, right around this time last year, Elsevier acquired B Press, and the response from our community was immediate. It was strong and it was vocal. Uh, in particular, uh, or in specific, I think because all of us recognize this was not an isolated incident, uh, that uh, Elsevier uh, has, a, has displayed a pattern of purchasing um, key pieces of infrastructure. But this particular um, acquisition, I think, struck so close to home because it was uh, infrastructure that's key not just in scholarly communication, but to our libraries, right? To have repository infrastructure 
purchased by Elsevier was, um, was a real wake-up call. Um, when we talked to folks in the community, we really saw the sentiments um, gelling uh, around a, a, a deep sense of concern that this was not a one-off, this is a pattern of behavior, the implications of that pattern of behavior uh, are, are significant to us, um, and that the particular concern that we have is that all the gains that we've made in the open access and open data uh, arena will be under threat if uh, we allow commercial control or the enclosure or the lockdown of key infrastructure for us. Um, and I think uh, uh, my friend Jason Priam at uh, Impact Story likes to say, we can't let them own the pipes. Like who owns the pipes will control what happens going forward. And that's, we'll talk a little bit about what, what does that mean to own the pipes? Um, but I think that reaction was, was quite wide, widespread. When we started to think in more detail um, about the community reaction here at Spark, we started to think about, well, okay, what infrastructure are we talking about, right? Um, um, uh, repository infrastructure, institutional repository infrastructure, scholarly communication infrastructure, uh, means a lot of different things to different people. And we got a nice assist um, uh, by asking folks on our campuses, you know, what, what do you see that, that's, that's happening? And what we heard back most often um, from people on campus was some iteration of this statement. And Elsevier is doing an end run around me and my library and going straight to our research offices, our provost, our sponsored research office, fill in the blank here, and trying to sell them something or, or you know, looking to, uh, uh, to, to layer a service or, or connect to our infrastructure in some way. And we recognized that uh, the problem was really widespread. The folks at the Knowledge Gap Project, um, uh, Posada and Chan at University of Toronto Scarborough, uh, published a paper um, just a few weeks or months, I think earlier uh, in last summer, where they looked at the um, sort of the scholarly communications process or what they call the academic knowledge production process across our campuses from actually doing research and you know, uh, 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 digging into asking the questions and conducting the research through communicating the research, right? That, that gray box is sort of the Skullcom vertical in the middle through evaluating research. So the whole end-to-end -end knowledge production process. And they took a look at the acquisitions that Elsevier has made over the past couple of decades and mapped those acquisitions onto um, the knowledge production cycle. And that gave us a really stark illustration of what, are, what, what were we talking about when we're talking about infrastructure being under threat of commercial control or lockdown um, in a very real and very visible way. So this uh, slide is an overlay of um, Elsevier's acquisitions in, uh, uh, over the past couple of decades and where they map in the knowledge production process. And it's not just in that Skullcom uh, vertical, of course, it's end-to-end -end, uh, embedding in the research uh, workflow from the conduct of research through the communication, through the evaluation. So um, the, the threat was, it is quite gigantic. And what we also found when we looked at this um, initially before we even started this analysis was um, Jorge, uh, Posada and Chan also uh, did an analysis of the, the nature of uh, the acquisitions of Elsevier. Relics is Elsevier's parent company. Um, that's their, uh, uh, it used to be Reed Elsevier. They changed their name to Relics a couple of years ago. And you can see that over the past um, decade, really, they've shifted their strategy in terms of acquisitions of companies from buying up companies that were primarily content providing companies or content related companies and into uh, data analytics in the academic and higher education space. And that to us said, you know, they've, they're, they're changing their game, they're changing their strategy, they're moving into a completely new arena. And while we have a basic, you know, understanding that, well, of course, you know, data analytics are important. Um, yeah, we're, we, we're, we see them moving into, you know, sort of the research assessment space. We recognize we really didn't know what their strategy was and what the full implications were for us in the library community and also for our academic, or the institutions that we're embedded in as operating units. 
So we wanted to um, uh, we wanted to take a look at this. So I should should say, sorry, I'm one slide ahead of me. Um, why does this? Why did it matter so much to us? And why were we so concerned about uh, uh, this potential move into a new space, a new strategy, or commercial control of this content uh, of this space? Well, we know the behavior of this particular player of Elsevier in the content space and the intent, the practices, our uh, uh, operating reality in the content world, and particularly in journals and databases, has been that they operate as a, you know, if not an outright monopoly, then at least a quasi-monopoly in the space. And we're concerned that if we didn't, if we don't understand fully what their strategy is moving into a new space, we run the risk of um, uh, laying ourselves open as a community for them to behave the same way, uh, just in a new space that matters just as much to us or potentially even more. So um, we started thinking at the end of last year, and I think many of you who are on uh, this webcast were part of conversations that we had with our Spark member libraries and um, other folks in the community uh, to try to, to uh, get a sense of a mandate for what is it that we can and should be doing um, to begin to address this problem in a constructive way. And what we came to the realization of is that uh, we really needed to understand better what, what is happening, what, the, what Elsevier's strategy was in this space, um, and that we, even though you know, I've, I've said before and I'll say again, I'm an MBA and I work for Elsevier, I don't have the financial acumen or the market savvy to understand what they're doing on a large scale. But there are a lot of people out there who do. Um, in particular, uh, folks who uh, cover um, the scholarly communications market or the media publications market for living uh, for investors um, on Wall Street, and that it might be a good idea for us to see if we could invest in um, expert analysis, uh, uh, in someone to do this analysis uh, with us and for us, um, who had the requisite kind of, of background. Um, and that is uh, what we decided to do. Uh, we were very lucky. Uh, we thought we thought long and hard, actually, about um, uh, what kind of person or company to bring in. Um, we recognized that to undertake the analysis that we wanted to do, we needed to bring in either you know someone with uh, who was active as a high level analyst or an organization like McKinsey and Company or Boston Consulting Group that could really put the kind of resources into. Uh, doing the analysis that we wanted to see. Um, uh, and so we uh, took a look at uh, interviewing different uh, potential players, and we ended up hiring longtime market um, analyst Claudio Espese, who uh, served for about a decade and change uh, covering um, European media stocks, the academic publishing market, and Reed Elsevier in particular for Stanford Bernstein um, investment firm. And Claudio is also really well suited to do this analysis and to work with us on this for two other reasons. Um, he had also spent time as a partner at McKinsey and Company, so he understands how to do this kind of um, uh, analysis for uh, on a client basis. And also, really interestingly, um, in between McKinsey and uh, working at Bernstein, he was the vice president of strategy at EMI Music um, at the time. Uh, that EMI had to define a new business model for moving into the digital age. So he has a unique understanding of disruption in digital media markets. And uh, uh, we, were, we were really excited to have the opportunity to work with him. So um, we got the mandate from our members in uh, late February to go ahead with this project. We did, we did our search. And in April, we retained Claudio and decided to map, we mapped out uh, what it was that we wanted to do uh, with him. What we asked Claudio to produce and what he has produced for us is essentially, um, uh, are essentially these things. A full analysis of the publishers, and this is very deliberate, publishers with an S. We started the conversation worrying about what Elsevier was doing and what their strategy was we very quickly realized with even a cursory look at the landscape that they're not the only players in the space um, and that we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, uh, unnecessarily limiting uh, the analysis to a single player, but rather making sure that we were looking at all of the players 
that might be germane to uh, 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 the, the, the end, end product of what we wanted to find out. Uh, so an analysis of the publishers who are currently developing or who are positioned to develop significant data businesses and this is signaling a little bit about what we found in our analysis, because you'll note that we had originally um, talked about doing an analysis of infrastructure. Um, well, I'm sure you, you, you were already seeing the connection between infrastructure and data, but um, we'll talk about that in detail as we talk about what we found out. Um, we wanted uh, the, the analysis to be a financial analysis, but also an analysis of their actions and what they imply as an indication of their larger long-term strategy to create a roadmap of where these actions and potential actions could affect our academic institutions, the institutions where our libraries are nested, the implications of the strategies again for us and for those, those institutions, a set of scenarios for how the publishers and the indus industry structure might um, rationally choose to evolve. Claudio's word is rationally. I, I, I leave it in there you know, as, a, as a nod to him. I don't know how rational this market actually is, as you'll see. And then an initial set of possible or proposed strategies that we might um, recommend that we as libraries and that our institutions take in response to what we find. So how are we doing this? Um, we set Claudio off uh, in early, as I said, in late, late spring. Um, down a path to to get this this analysis started and he did this in and has been doing this in th in three ways um, extensively interviewing uh, a wide variety of offices in higher education institutions both our one universities and you know teaching uh, liberal arts and teaching colleges in North America and we limited this particular analysis to North America just uh, for a couple reasons one for but to be able to get it done, frankly, and second, because our remit as Spark North America, these are where our members are. Um, and he interviewed, you know, everyone from uh, folks in our libraries to sponsored research to offices of innovation to CIO's office, uh, you know, a whole range of offices to see where the commercial vendors are visiting, what they're pitching, what they're offering, what they're leaving behind uh, to really try to get a view from on the ground of what our institutions were seeing. Um, because uh, Claudio and many and, and several of us at Spark um, have worked in uh, the academic publishing space, uh, we were also able to take advantage of a very deep network of contacts in um, many of these organizations, frankly. Uh, and uh, Claudio has been at work interviewing current and former um, employees and executives of many of the organizations uh, that are in, uh, actively in play in this arena. So it's been really useful to also get that uh, perspective in the analysis. And then of course, analyzing the available financial data, um, other kinds of data and literature on strategies, both publisher strategies, as well as the university activities that, uh, that they're going after. So um, as I said, we brought in the playing field of companies that this analysis covered from the get go. Um, and we broadened it to include uh, this set of players, Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, Clarivate, Academic Analytics. That group of the first four, you'll notice, um, share something in common. They are the players that are primarily uh, focused on research and um, uh, uh, research publications, journals. But we also added in Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and Cengage, because the more we dug into um, uh, 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 looking at the players who are active in the infrastructure slash data space on our campuses, the more we recognized that the players in the learning, teaching, uh, and student space uh, share quite closely the same tactics, strategies, and end goals as the players in the research space. And we didn't want to do sort of half an analysis. We wanted to cover uh, the entire infrastructure landscape um, uh, as best we could in this uh, um, uh, in this arena. Um, so what have we learned? Uh, again, Claudio and, and the, Spark, the team at Spark have been at work on this over the summer and through the fall, uh, and we've dug in uh, quite deeply on this, and we found a few things. Um, as I you know, just telegraphed, the scope of the, of the, the issue of the problem of commercial uh, uh, takeover or control of infrastructure is a whole lot bigger 
um, than we originally thought. And while we started this project, as I mentioned earlier, oh, bigger than we thought, right? So the academic, uh, the knowledge production process, right, in research is one component, but it extends earlier into the business of the university and into student um, recruitment, retention, student performance, faculty uh, evaluation of research, but also faculty evaluation, productivity, outputs of, of faculty, um, really the end-to-end -end business of the university is represented in the infrastructure that is, is um, in the scope of these companies. And that the infrastructure is important, right? But it is not, the end game of these companies is not to own the infrastructure uh, per se and, and leave it at that. The infra infrastructure is important, but it's really about the data produced by, stored on, um, generated through, attendant to the infrastructure that's the end-to-end -end infrastructure of, um, of, the, uh, of the university. We kind of shorthanded this internally, like using um, uh, a phrase from the, the Clinton campaign in, the, uh, in the, the early 90s that, you know, when they used to say it's the economy stupid, we're like, it's the data stupid, right? I'm reminding ourselves that this is actually what they're interested in. And they're interested in it because the data, whether it's research data, whether it's data about student learning, whether it's uh, information about faculty productivity, the data produced by universities collectively represents a largely untapped, brand new, potentially multi-trillion dollar market. Right? This is um, uh, an incredible new opportunity for commercial companies, also for universities, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but what these companies are seeing is this market. I mean, kind of to put it in perspective, think about the content market. The journal uh, uh, market is uh, generally characterized as a roughly, uh, um, I'm sorry, $10 billion a year revenue producing industry. And the same for textbooks, right? So we're, we're talking about a content market that's about a $20 billion a year revenue producing industry. When you think about moving up into the infrastructure space, you're getting up into the you know, uh, you're starting to get up into the, the, the multi-billions of dollars. And by the time you look at the, the potential value of the data that overlies the, the infrastructure, you're looking at a potential multi-trillion dollar marketplace, especially when you combine the data with the intellectual property of the university. It is an enormous, enormous market. That's why these companies have been moving into and they're calling themselves data analytics company with data in their sites. And this, of course, has profound implications for the operations of higher education institutions, right? Not just libraries. Um, it affects the entire institution. And I think this is one of our most important uh, takeaways and is really uh, coloring the kinds of strategies that we're looking at and the recommendations that we're making. Um, it affects their mission. Um, it affects their finances and their ability to control their own decisions and destinies. The more, in terms of mission, the more data that's collected and the more that it's used to inform and drive decisions in teaching, student management and research, the more influence the companies have on out, can have on outcomes and decision making from the enrollment process to graduation rates to faculty evaluation. The less understanding that institutions have on how, how on what data these companies have and what algorithms they're using to make recommendations back to universities, um, the higher the risk of unintended consequences um, that can challenge university goals like equality, equity, privacy, transparency, really significant goals. In terms of finances, you know, these players have had relatively little impact frankly, on the overall operations of universities to date, despite the fact that they've had huge impacts on our library budgets, we're very small operating units of the universities. But the products, the services, the, the infrastructure that these folks are starting to sell us or buy out um, uh, will impact the, the, the business of universities in a much, much, much deeper way. And again, um, the choice, uh, 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 the issue of control, right, the issue of uh, universities relying on data that's in the hands of commercial companies who provide an analysis and then sell that analysis back to our universities without us knowing anything really about the algorithms that were used to make to construct these analyses really calls into question uh, the fundamental 
control of the decision-making processes of our universities. I think this sounds really dramatic to say, you know, that this, uh, the strategy that these companies have um, is really the battle for the heart and soul of, uh, of uh, the operation of higher education in, in, in North America, at least. But I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the implications are truly that profound. And they're certainly profound for students, the faculty, the researchers and administrators um, and these institutions, because their data, our data, is what makes up the new market. Um, uh, yeah, makes up the new market. Um, and how are they doing this? Uh, well, we're watching and uh, uh, through the interview process and through visiting campuses, one of the things that we've seen is that publishers are, are whether they're doing it deliberately or not is still, um, I think remains to be seen, but they're kind of using this uh, divide and conquer approach. And, and um, really they're doing this significantly in the research space. They're a little more organized in the learning the teaching and learning uh, management systems approach, but uh, the Elsevates, the Elsevates, I always merge Elsevier and Clarivate into Elsevate. I don't know why I do that. The Elseviers, the Springers, the academic analy analytics, they're, they're visiting um, by and large various offices um, on our campuses and you know, offering to sell them something that will help the principal in that office do their job better. Their pitch is, we understand the business of your university better than you do, and we can help you do your job better through this particular tool. Um, and they're doing it, again, department by department. This end run around our libraries to departments means that they visit disparate offices. Um, Claudio visited one campus as an example where he asked our library dean to connect him with just the offices that Elsevier had visited. Um, and she connected him with five offices three of which had contracted for uh, different um, platforms or services from Elsevier. None of the three knew that the others had even been visited, let alone contracted with Elsevier for that product. So there's a, a, a sense of operating in, in, in the, the atmosphere where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand doesn't know what the left foot is doing, and the publishers are taking advantage of that. Whether it's delivered or not, that's the way it is, it is playing out. And it's playing out right now. Um, timing is everything in terms of uh, being able to turn the tide on uh, what's happening in the infrastructure and data space. The sense of urgency is very real. Um, they're visiting our campuses regularly. Uh, relationships are being established. And um, uh, uh, things are happening in real time. So. Um, uh, one of the, the strategies that we see the publishers doing, for example, and Elsevier is the leader in this, is visiting our universities uh, and particularly looking at data science departments, donating large sums of money to that department. In return, they're embedding fellows or uh, uh, research associates into uh, data science divisions, and they're learning more about the workflows of the university, learning more about um, what infrastructure is important, how it's deployed, uh, and where they can refine their services to be indispensable, frankly, to the operations of the universities. So uh, the, the, the sense of urgency is very real. And that's difficult, uh, a difficult thing to, um, to combat after a certain point. Uh, and once, once they get too far out of the gate on this, um, switching costs are going to become really, really high, and it's going to be very difficult for us to think about uh, deploying strategies that can work. Like once, you, once you have tools or infrastructure that's embedded into the workflow, particularly where data is concerned of the university, I think we all know it's really hard to switch out. It's really hard to substitute. It becomes expensive. Data migration um, issues become almost you know, untenable to think about uh, how we can, how we would even manage that. Um, the other thing that we're worried about, of course, and that we're finding uh, is, is doubly um, uh, uh, urgent is that because what we're talking about isn't just control of infrastructure, but it's also uh, control of, um, uh, of data from the university, the uh, issues around um, the potential for monopolies, uh, oligopolies, or, or even natural monopolies are just uh, magnified. And it's, it's, it's been a...
you know, markets, um, you can see that uh, uh, any time you have a, a, a market that's comprised of data, particularly data that represents a currency, like TV ratings, or even closer to home for us, journal impact factors, when these become widely accepted as like the necessary standard in any industry, the cost of not using them becomes super high and it lends, it's sort of a self-fulfilling um, oligopoly or monopoly. You have to have this data because it's used to judge you. And you can see in data analytics, student performance or research outputs or research uh, 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 output analysis, we're, we're really on the brink of um, repeating the problem of impact factor and reliance on the commercial players for publications and journals uh, in the data, the, the, the um, infrastructure and data space. Um, so that's all really scary stuff that we found. Um, it is not a small problem. Um, it's a set of issues that are very complex and span the operations of the university, which makes it quite daunting for, um, for us to think about from the perspective of the library community to uh, digging in and, and uh, recommending solutions for. Um, but that's something that we were, really, we were really dedicated to doing and we really wanted to do. So is there anything that we can do about it? And the answer I think is, uh, the answer we're finding is yes. Um, one thing that we found is while uh, urgency is real, the progress that these players have made it, they haven't advanced as far as we were initially, you know, sort of terrified that they had. They haven't taken over this space yet. Their strategy is very clear, and in the analysis that we produced, you'll see that, but they don't own the space yet, the infrastructure space or the data space yet. So there is time, which is, uh, which is um, uh, I think, very uh, reassuring. And when we look at uh, what we can possibly think about doing about this, we're seeing that possible responses fall into two broad buckets um, and that actions from both of these buckets are going to be necessary, but um, uh, they're, not, they're not crazy potential solutions or crazy uh, unthinkable solutions. So the first bucket of responses really look like the kinds of things we talked about in our initial um, meetings uh, with the Spark members around risk mitigation responses, like how do we um, uh, how do we mitigate the risk of commercial takeover of this infrastructure and the data? Um, and they're very common sense, right, um, uh, strategies. Uh, one of the things that we looked at, for, for example, is, okay, so what we're really talking about here is looking at uh, heading off the ability of these players from taking over um, uh, our data space, right, the data production and data ownership space in our universities. And yet when we look at uh, data policies at our institutions, right, publicly available data policies, we find that by and large, um, we collected a whole set of, um, of, of policies uh, that are available on websites. And we looked at them and we found that they tend to be pretty much tactical, purely tactical and technical in nature. They're not strategic, they're not designed to address this issue, but they could be repurposed to help set um, uh, to, to, to articulate what we want to do and not want to do with data more widely on our, on our, our campuses. Um, so one uh, 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 possible set of recommendations that we're looking at are to define a list of elements that are in data policies and that uh, identify those that are not yet in data policies that would require explicit definition data property and portability, reuse and resale of data, control over data in case of government requests, transparency of algorithms and data products, time limits on retention, all these kinds of things that we're, we think about and talk about in individual pockets in the community, but that are not yet part of a coordinated university or college institution uh, policy or strategy for dealing with um, uh, inf infrastructure that deals with data. Um, along the similar, sort of similar lines, we're seeing a handful of institutions say, yes, this kind of coordination is important on the policy level, but it's also really important to head off that left hand doesn't know what the right hand doesn't know what the left foot is doing in terms of signing contracts that touch on or relate to infrastructure that produces or houses data on our campuses and looking at uh, the recommendation that there should be some 
position on campus. Claudio likes the data czar analogy. I'm not crazy about that, but the idea of chief data officers, we are seeing uh, gaining a little bit of traction. But in specific, when you look at the urgency of the issue and the need for coordination, some of the pointers say this function at the very least um, should be present on our campuses. So we're looking at recommendations around that. Um, we talked about this from the get-go, right? That the one of the ways to ensure community ownership of infrastructure and also by extension data is to really look at establishing principles and contracting and procurement terms and conditions for buying or leasing infrastructure, but also that relate to uh, use, reuse, ownership of the data that's on, those, uh, on, the, on that infrastructure from the get-go. Um, so we're working at sketching out uh, uh, a set of principles and uh, procurement and contracting terms and conditions um, that could be used to essentially um, lock the market to open. Um, and these principles, terms and conditions will really need to be socialized across institutions in order to be effective. Um, I want to say, and I'll talk, uh, talk a bit about this in a, uh, in a couple of minutes when, when I talk about um, the materials that we're producing and that will be available to you shortly. Um, we don't pretend to have the be all and end all and the perfect principles or uh, uh, terms and conditions, but we will have a uh, straw man or, you know, uh, at least the scaffolding uh, for these articulated, but we will need the community. Obviously, this is something that community input and, um, and, and, uh, and response to will be, will be very important. Um, yeah, lock the market open for competition, I think is one of the phrases and one of the outcomes that we've been thinking about in this sort of risk mitigation bucket. Lock the market open for competition. The risks that we have in front of us are really that the commercial players will control the market in an, uh, in an oligopoly or in a monopoly um, uh, kind of a situation. When we say lock the market open for competition, we're not saying lock the market open and saying that every piece of, of infrastructure needs to be open source or op completely open. Um, I think that's an, we think that's an unrealistic, at least initial goal. Um, but what we do want to have is a, uh, an operating arena in this market where open source competitors have the opportunity to directly compete with commercial players, right? Where it is not what we have locked ourselves, found ourselves locked into in the content environment, where it's very difficult for new players to kind of get in and, and compete. And these procurement terms and conditions, having the vendors compete for our business, uh, for infrastructure tools and services um, in the data arena that compete not only on price, but on our values as higher ed institutions is, the, is one way to really um, uh, uh, have a strong effect to lock the market to open. Um, and we can talk more about what those kinds of terms and conditions uh, look like or might look like in the, in the Q&A. Um, uh, this is uh, something you know, that, that, that also falls under this, this risk mit mitigation um, strategy bucket is you know, we can do a lot with policy, we can do a lot with contracting terms and conditions, um, but we also need uh, investment. And this I know is something that rings very true to uh, the organizers of this series, you know, both Mike Roy, uh, David Lewis, um, and their colleagues, Diane Graves and others, have been thinking about what will it take to um, invest in uh, infrastructure and, and community-owned infrastructure, infrastructure that is uh, more community friendly than these commercial players are showing uh, the intent to build. Locking the market open will uh, go uh, uh, will go a certain distance um, to uh, uh, ensuring that there can be competition by open players, um, but it's it it won't do any good uh, if we don't have strategies for investing in high level. Um, competition in, in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure and data uh, analytics providers in this space. And when we say consider professionalized community investment in instruments and, and collectives, one of the things that um, 
I think one of the, the lessons that we're learning as we go through this process, having people who do this for a living conduct the analysis with us rather than always trying to rely on, you know, sort of community homegrown um, and, and well-intentioned uh, efforts is, I think, going to be increasingly important in this, in this space. The amount of investment that's going to be needed, we're not, I, I think we can't um, conceive of doing the job that needs to be done if we're simply thinking about library budgets alone and not looking at strategies for investment that include partnerships with funders, partnerships with our larger academic institutions, as well as contributions from the library community. Uh, so we're looking at, um, at that set of strategies as well. The second bucket of strategies um, uh, I'll, uh, are, are really interesting. The first, as I mentioned, are sort of mit risk mitigation and the sort of common sense uh, actions that we can, we can actually you know, think about taking um, uh, and helping to facilitate uh, from our community. But the second bucket um, is, I think, our, our decisions and implications uh, that are really gonna be very personal uh, to higher education institutions on almost an, in, an, an individual, one-on-one one on, one on one, um, kind of basis. And we, cons we consider these um, balancing act decisions, right? So it's gonna be up to any given institution how they might want to proceed in thinking about uh, uh, decisions for contracting with commercial players in the infrastructure and data space or um, doing things slightly differently. The, the first sort of set of balancing acts is the beauty of what working with these commercial players provide is a lot of data to help you make decisions. The negative thing about working with these companies is that they, there's a lot of data to help you make decisions, right? And that might sound weird, but think about the fact that um, data services really offer the trade-offs to, to, to do things. They may give you uh, information based on a lot of data about how to evaluate faculty members on the one hand, but you have no idea what kinds of biases may have been introduced into the algorithms that they're using on the data that you can't see to make the recommendations to you about what to do. So you have a lot of, you know, you have a lot of, uh, you have information based on a lot of data on the one hand, but not a lot of transparency about how that decision was actually made. Whereas on the other hand, if you decide, well, maybe I'm not going to, you know, rely so much on, on uh, 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 this vast amount of data, but rather insert my own subjective um, decision-making process into the evaluation process, uh, you, you lose, you know what biases are going in because they're yours, right? So you can see these kinds of decisions that are gonna come up time and time again um, in all kinds of processes that the, these companies are saying, hey, we can help you do your job better, uh, you know, uh, professors who are looking to identify at-risk students, uh, enrollment officers who are looking to get the best students, uh, research, uh, VCs for research who are looking to say who's doing the best research on your campus, right? These are really personal sort of decisions that, that, that campuses are going to have to make. And so recommendations for thinking through the implications of commercial or non-commercial decisions um, in those arenas are really interesting. And the second piece or illustration of this, you know, sort of balancing act is uh, around the money, right? This is, as we mentioned, a potential multi-trillion dollar new market. The commercial companies want to monetize this and they're moving very aggressively into doing that. To monetize it, they have to get ownership or control of the university's data. What if the higher education institution decides at any given point or wants the ability to decide do I want to retain the, the ability to monetize the data, the IP attendant to it in certain circumstances for my own use, for the benefit of my own institution? Those are valid questions and they're questions that should be asked up front as we're, as we're going through this process, right? As you're thinking about what are the terms and conditions look like that you might write into contracts. The, the answers are going to be very different in this set of, of, of responses they're much more individualized than in that first kind of risk mitigation set of, of strategies. So I'm, um, I'm gonna just wrap up by uh, just giving you very quickly 
where we are in this process and um, what you can expect to see next. So the initial analysis, um, uh, including the articulation of the strategies of all the players that, that, uh, that we listed earlier is largely complete. And the document is like a 50 page document with lots of appendices and all kinds of things. So the detail will be there for anybody who wants to dig into the financials, the strategies, you know, the whole kit and caboodle for uh, the Spark community. We are um, intending uh, to circulate, it just went to my steering committee, my board um, a week ago. Uh, it will be ready for public distribution in the next few weeks, um, sooner rather than later. It is because it is such a, as you probably gathered from this presentation, a data intensive document with lots of uh, um, implications. We are planning and we are currently scheduling the opportunity for um, uh, members only webcasts to walk you through documents, in-person meetings to also walk you through this analysis with both Claudio and myself to answer questions. We'll have lots of opportunities uh, to do that. We're not just gonna throw this document out there and say, here's the analysis, um, you know, do it, do, make of it what you will because it's, uh, there's a lot in there. The document contains uh, a bit of detail on the proposed response sets. Um, which are drafted, but the intent, as I mentioned, is to flesh those out with community input and also to prepare a completely separate document on responses for two reasons. One, we realize that the analysis is going to quickly circulate out of our control, and we really don't want the, the detailed response document as part of that analysis out there early in, in uh, with the ability for um, some of the commercial vendors to get a hold of it and you know start block plays of their own on that um, we're not trying to be um, cagey or you know um, opaque um, but we are trying to be realistic about what's likely to happen um, what we're doing now also is we recognize that the analysis and the documents and the communications not materials that will prepare out of this analysis right we need things that are, um, are are tractable are designed to educate our library community leaders and members first but they are s explicitly designed to hand off and up to university leaders at the vice you know the research administration provost cio chief financial officer level um, it really is a strategy that is going to require buy-in and frankly the strategies will have to be run and adopted by leadership in higher education universities at, at, at universities and um, and colleges we're talking with individuals on campuses uh, at the provost level the VC of research level uh, the CIO level we wanted to let them in early um, ha have them help us shape the directions that we're going in, the kinds of responses that uh, we're recommending. Um, but we also can use your help in identifying people who will be willing to dig into this with us and then take this to their peers. We're working with AAU and a APLU to get on their agendas for, the, for their provost and president's meeting to make sure that um, this is uh, socialized in those institutions. But the only people that can put this on their agenda are actual members at the provost and president level. So that is something that we need um, uh, that we need your help in doing. And that's what this slide actually says. Um, yeah. So uh, we definitely need your help with the next phase uh, once the once the analysis is distributed. Uh, feedback on the documents, uh, poking holes, places you'd like to see us go deeper ideas for fleshing out the responses and strategies, uh, uh, ideas for um, communications documents or forums or places that we should be going and talking to people as we complete this process. We're all ears uh, and wanna hear um, any of your ideas and thoughts on, on what to do next. So I'm gonna stop here. I know there's a, just a ton <laughs> of details that we went through um, and I'm happy to take questions on any or all of it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Heather. We'll let you pause for a minute and catch your breath. Um, we do have some questions that are coming in through our chat window, as well as we have a Q&A window for our, our audience to ask questions. So post your question for Heather wherever you're most comfortable. 
I'm going to start with our first one um, regarding the list of data policy revisions. Does this list exist now? And that, I'm sorry. I'm, can, can you which list? The list of data policy revisions. Um, we're starting on that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we're we're kind of 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 a couple minds on how the what the best way to do it is. Like, we can start a community document for people to contribute to. Um, but I think what we might want to do is just kind of have a, a skeleton list. Uh, we're not quite sure where to where we would post something like that. So if the community has ideas for partnering with people to do this, if somebody's really interested in helping us dig into it, um, we're all ears on on figuring out how to best do that. Okay, and I guess along those lines, in your presentation at the end, you mentioned wanting feedback from from this group, from the community. Do you have methods in place for people to share that feedback? Is it just um, simply like sending you an email? I think what we're going to do is start out with having um, opportunities for us to talk, uh, to kind of do this in a, maybe a, a more condensed version once we distribute the analysis, right? We want people to take a look at it. Um, we'll walk through, um, you know, sort of a high level. Here's what, here's what uh, we think about the analysis and then have people first and foremost in in-person forums um, on another webcast and then uh, maybe starting uh, smaller working groups with different people in, in, in the Spark office leading those working groups to, to ask people to help us dig into it. So um, if you have thoughts now, please feel free to email. If you prefer to wait for the analysis, which I'm suspecting most people will, um, again, we'll have those in-person forums. Um, hopefully, the first one I think we're looking to schedule right around uh, the CNI meeting. We were hoping to, uh, to do it as, an, uh, as part of CNI, but I'm not sure that that timing's gonna work out. Okay. Have you had any response from campus leaders? Yes. So one of the things that we've done, as I mentioned, was use um, some uh, 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 campus leaders, provosts, uh, CIOs of Spark member libraries as kind of test cases. So we provided them with uh, the, the basic analysis and then we walked them through it. And I have to say the response from uh, particularly the CIOs that we've talked to, but also the provosts, is we know that this is an issue. The, CI uh, the two of the CIOs said, versions of the same thing. I've been wrestling with this for like five years, you know, mm -hmm. thank you. We need to get the attention of the community. We need to do something coordinated. The provosts are, are, have been uniformly, I will say like, yes, this is an enormous issue. We don't know what to do about it. Thank you for providing the basis. We are willing, we had two who are actually willing to start the ball rolling with trying to get it on AAU and APLU's agenda. So the initial response has been very gratifying. Um, and also a lot of, have you thought about, you know, X or, oh, I knew about Y, but I hadn't thought about putting the teaching and learning um, uh, uh, infrastructure and data services in the same bucket as the research ones. And this is, this is really useful in helping us kind of paint a larger picture across our campus about implications. So the response has been positive so far. Um, we'll see when we actually make the actual recommendations about, you know, uh, what do you think? Can you do something like uh, hire a chief data officer? Is that a possibility on your campus, um, what the responses are? But initially, they've been pretty good. Okay. And we did receive a comment from someone in our audience who said that their vice provost for research has been working with their library on both policy and infrastructure fronts. And they've also had engagement from one of the centers in their School of Public Health. So that's coming from Johns Hopkins University. Which is amazing. And I think this kind of institutional coordination, you know, that theme ran through that first sex, that first bucket of risk mitigation strategies loud and clear. Um, when Claudio was on, and I'm not allowed to say which campus it was for, you know, obvious reasons, and went to the offices that, that didn't know that, you know, each other had signed contracts with Elsevier, the response was like, kind of, um, he said, oh, I think I started a fire, you know, on the campus. It was, uh, you know, why didn't you tell me kind of thing, but it was so illustrative. And it, that story, I think, has rung chords or struck chords on so many other campuses. It's like, this is just the way we operate, right? There's so many silos, but the, 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 um, the, 
the stakes are so high in this particular arena that if we that articulating the stakes I think is is a really helpful step in getting people to understand why we might need to do something more coordinated in this instance across our campuses. Okay. Do you have any ideas about the situation in the EU? Do I have any ideas about the situation in the EU? I, I mean, I would say, I think that they share many of, um, many of these issues. There are obviously, there are some operating structures that are, that are different, um, especially in terms of uh, the use of um, uh, how uh, research productivity and things are measured and higher education institutions are measured. They have a much more systematic framework like in the UK, uh, across the European Union. So there's already some level of coordination that I think is a little bit different than here in the United States. That said, that coordination isn't always great because the metrics that are, are used to judge higher ed institutions in terms of rankings in the UK, for example, are often generated now by, are, are already generated by some of these commercial companies. So they, they share the, the concerns. I think some of the strategies will be different because they're to some degree, in some cases farther down the pike, already having agreements or ownership of this process by, by the commercial folks. Whereas we have the ability, I think, to intervene earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. The hard thing for us is when you go, when, when Elsevier or Clarivate or somebody walks onto campus and says to, you know, your provost or your VC for research, I can help you do your job better because I know your business better than you do. The job oftentimes that they're doing or, or that they're saying they know how to do better um, is designed to achieve specific things like going up in university rankings or, you know, uh, 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 specific metrics like that, that these companies, again, are, uh, are, are in the position to control. So that, that danger of not just owning the pipes and the data, but becoming also owners of the metrics that are generated out of that data, just is, that lock-in is, 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 is terrifying. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from our audience? While we're waiting for any final questions to come in, I just want to remind you all to save the date for the final webinar in this series. On Wednesday, December 5th at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will be having the webinar How For-Profit Companies Can Be a Part of the Open, of, part of the open Environment. So you will be receiving a webinar invite for that later in November, but just to keep that in mind, the series has been very popular amongst our members who have the opportunity to attend live, but also for the Duraspace community as they're able to access the, the presentation slides and recordings <laughs> of our webinar series. So we thank you all for attending today. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. So at this time, Heather, we can't thank you enough. The work that you guys have been involved in is so relevant, so fascinating, and it, it seems like this is just the start of it. So we definitely look forward to participating and sharing feedback and taking a look more closely at those results. And thank you for letting DuraSpace members be the first to, to hear your presentation. Thank you guys so much for having me and for spending the time today and um, for allowing me to try to figure out how to begin to present this, this, uh, this to the community. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Heather's email is up on the screen. If you have any feedback for her or further questions, don't hesitate to contact her. This concludes our session today, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.